This is Steve Stein, and you're listening to Inside Asia. This week, I'm in Singapore with Rosalind Chow Ku, founder and CEO of CXA, the first private insurance and workplace wellness exchange in Asia. She's in the process of disrupting the Asia healthcare insurance sector. I know what you're thinking. Here we go. Another disruptor. Let's face it. Disruption is a buzzword, particularly in the States. It's hard to find someone who isn't disrupting something, but Rosalind is the real deal. This is what disruption really looks like. Anyone who has ever had to buy health insurance knows just how convoluted and opaque things can be. Try filing a claim. There are co-pays and deductibles, and even if there is someone out there who knows what needs to be done, issues remain. There's patient privacy, there's medical reimbursement, you know the drill. But maybe that's starting to change. That's what's interesting and thrilling about my conversation with Rosalind. In this episode of Inside Asia, you're going to hear how insurance is poised to become one of the last in a long line of industries to fall to disruptive forces of the internet. This is a story you've heard before. Amazon started it, then eBay, then aggregators like Travelocity. Pick an industry that hasn't been threatened or reshaped by the web. It's been a boon to consumers, a come-to-Jesus moment for companies, and now it's hitting the insurance industry. That's big news. Insurers have no interest in simplifying the process. They make big money by keeping data out of the hands of consumers and the employers who have to pay for health insurance. Their whole business model is based on the idea that a majority of healthy employees will make up and pay for the health care costs of the few who aren't so healthy. It's this playing the odds that has allowed healthcare companies to make big profits, an obscene amount in some cases. Here's where Rosalind comes in. She's launched CXA as a better, more cost-effective, tailor-made alternative to the insurance products offered by others. It's going to make life better for millions of people. As we find out, her secret is data, and lots of it. That's right, it's data. Data analysis that's letting Rosalind and the folks at CXA even the odds that up until now have always been tipped in favor of the big insurance companies. They've been able to customize healthcare coverage to suit personal needs and requirements. She's hit upon a new business model. That's what it means to disrupt an industry. I started off by taking her back to the moment when her big idea was not much more than a distant notion. I remember you came to see me when I was at my last company yeah. about four or five years ago and you said, I have this idea. Yeah. And your eyes were bright and shining and you had this kind of view that I think we can cut through, we can break down the old model and I have a different view on how to get it done. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, yeah. So I came to Steve because Steve was my client and Steve was an entrepreneur the same time I was. And so you introduced me to my first VC. Is that true? Yes, yes, Yen Lu Chao. Oh, right. So you introduced me, and I went to Yen Lu and started talking to him about the idea. Oh, I did. I had no idea. Yeah, actually, so oh, okay. you got me started. Oh, and, and and then what did he invest? Um, no. he ended up no, no, <laughs> no. So he was going to invest, yeah. and actually a whole a, a large group. Yeah. But at that point, I went to the MAS. At that point, I had built a prototype in my apartment. Um, I had a group of entrepreneurs who were willing to invest. I did due diligence to buy a brokerage firm, and I had gone to the regulator and asked and told them, look, I have this group of investors. We want to buy this firm. And you know what? They said, no, right. you can't. We are afraid that if you have investors, especially PE firms, they're going to come into this SME, take out all the people, and sell it off. Right. So you have to be the yeah. sole shareholder. This is a really big part of the story. Um, and, and, and MAS is the, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Yes. And Singapore is, a, is a, a major financial center in, in Asia, but it's also very stringent and very conservative when it comes Super. to these things. But you haven't told us yet what the business idea was. Yes. Yeah, so when I was working at Mercer, um, we had actually grown 800%. But despite the growth, I was told by clients that I really did not add enough value and didn't solve their main pain points. And what were you doing with Mercer at the time? Tell people what Mercer's primary business was. So Mercer was an HR consultancy and a brokerage at helping firms to actually 
work on their benefits plans and also negotiate their ins- insurance. Healthcare plans. Healthcare yeah. plans. Okay. All right. Yes. So I was the head of the 14 countries in Asia PAC. Okay. So I was the regional head. So your response was to clients saying, there's not enough value add here. I think you're taking a big, a, a big margin. You're taking away from the business, yes. from the value. And you realize there's some truth in that. Yeah, yeah. And you figured there's a better way to kind of break through. And that's when you got the entrepreneurs together. But what was the core idea? there? What were you trying to, where where were you, where was the breakaway? The core idea was that we actually had to solve the rising costs of healthcare. So every year was rising double digit. For some clients, it was rising 25% a year, doubling every three years. So what we needed to do was actually get at why people see a doctor and go to the hospital. We have to fix and make them healthier. So this is cost to serve. This is the, what, what insurance companies had to pay out to cover claims. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they charge premiums and because companies were getting unhealthier all the time and having lots of people go to the doctor and the hospitals, that's why they charge so much. So we had to get at the source of what's causing people to claim in order to lower the cost. So what I did was I actually figured out how to do it and how to build the tech. So every year for five years, I went to New York headquarters to build a business case to justify why they needed to invest in this tech so that we can correct this problem. And this tech was really data. It was analytics on usage patterns, a way that people were going and engaging with the healthcare systems in order to understand how to basically navigate, manage, and improve health in order to get lower payout. Is that right? Exactly. That's exactly it. So we had to figure out what was causing them to claim and get them to modify their behavior so they get healthier or help them manage their chronic disease. Chronic disease is hitting Asia 10 years before the West. That's big. Can you just talk just two minutes on that? Because the changing disease patterns in Asia is a huge factor here, isn't it? It is. It is. So Asians who look skinny actually are likely to get diabetes uh, for a couple of reasons. There's more abdominal fat in Asians. They have less muscle mass. Also, Asians are raised by the tiger mom, except here, everyone thinks tiger mom is a wimp. So you can imagine growing up as a child, studying and playing musical instruments, but not exercising (laughs) and eating white rice, noodles and ghee. So the diet, the stress from tiger moms and the workplace, right? And the abdominal genetics. So together, that's basically driving a shift in disease patterns from maybe traditional dengue or malaria or other things into more modern diseases yes. like heart disease, exactly. high blood pressure, or things Diabetes. of this. Diabetes, yes. Okay. So we had to go and find a way to actually manage chronic disease okay. and prevent it from happening. So then you brought the idea to Mercer five years in a row, kept yes. trying to push the idea. They said, yeah, yeah, nice idea, Rosalind, but you know, go back to Asia and we'll see you next year. Yes. At some point, you decided, okay. I'm tired of banging my head against the wall. Yeah. So at the end, what actually happened was that the CEO got fired. My boss in New York, who was the global head, got fired. And my new boss was someone who I took all my employees from (laughs) head of the U.S. Okay. And so there was a changing of the guard. And so I got expelled with everybody else. And, when and they changed the guard. So so it really was perfect opportunity to now go after your own venture. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. And I didn't know what to do. Yeah. So Steve was one of those people I went to to say, well, I think maybe I do have an idea. And yeah. so maybe I should go and look at this as yeah. well as everything else. Yeah. And I remember you did an extraordinary job explaining it. And it was like all the bells were going off. And I just thought, yeah, but where, you know, what, look at the industry you're trying to disrupt. And we're talking about you know insurance yeah. as one of the most entrenched old school uh, you know, it's all about agents and kind of brokers and yes. there's so much uh, opaqueness to it. How, I mean, in some ways, the biggest single opportunity and in another way, one of the biggest single challenges. It is because if brokers only negotiate the best rate for your insurance, how helpful is that rather than solving and getting people healthier to lower their costs? Mm. 
So let's go back now. Sorry, we're jumping a little bit, but this is important little background mm -hmm. backgrounders to, to the story of MAS, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. They said, Rosalind, great idea, like where you're going, but basically you need to self-fund it or you need to pr be the pri primary on this. Yes. We cannot include private equity firms because of the danger of them flipping it and not sticking by it. And that way we're going to approve you and give you the appropriate licensing in order to operate. So what did you do? So this was the hard part. I was always ready to invest my own money. And this was selling off my shares from, from my startups. <laughs> what was left? Um, and, and, yeah. and my severance from Mercer. So I still remember the day that I went and found my husband's keys to his cabinet to check find out how much money he had. <laughs> and so... <laughs> and, and he kept his money in a closet or not in the bank? Well, I don't know where he kept his money, but I was never concerned before. But that day, I opened his cabinet with Rachel, who was employee number one. And she remembers me going in and coming back out later and saying, oh my God, my husband has the money. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so I, of course, asked my husband to spend not just my money, but his money. Yeah. And it's you know, our entire life savings of five million dollars, but that wasn't enough. So I went to DBS and I signed a personal guarantee to borrow another five. And, and DBS is is the a, a major bank here in Singapore. Yes, it's yeah. the largest bank. But because I signed a personal guarantee. I actually removed my name from all our real estate in the U.S. because I didn't want the real estate taken away in case we lose all the money. So this was the big bet. We're all in. Yes. And that's what it took. It took $10 million in order to buy the company. And, and build a platform and pay my team. Right. And, and that lasted. How long was that going to take you? What was the burn rate on that? So that... <laughs> So I do the acquisition. I open up the bank account. There is no money and I have no more money. So there is no money. At what point there was no money? Right when I buy the acquisition. Well, that was it. So, the, so, so in fact, you did you you mismanaged. You yes, you did yes. not plan appropriately. Yes, I spent it all, <laughs> and I bought the company, and we had no money. So we. I, I do not want to payroll. shop with you ever. <laughs> <laughs> so we couldn't pay payroll. Yeah. So. And that was month one. That was just at startup. That was actually that acquired. Was day it. one. Yeah. yeah, that was day one. <laughs> so what did you do? Um, so we asked all the employees if it was okay if they didn't get paid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and because you'd managed people in the past and been so successful at it, they yeah, all said they all stayed. Yeah. Now why? Um, Minia had worked for me before. Okay. And also because we bought a company that was really profitable, it's just we had to wait for the bills to be paid. Right. So the collection. Yeah. So okay. we were just waiting collection. So we knew we had two months. So yeah. people weren't paid for two months. And two months later, the money came in. Okay. And this Singapore was the first then insurance agency uh, broker yes. that you bought. And then you had the technology yeah. and you had a series of people who were engineers who were developing the platform. You started to then collect data. Data. How did you access data on patients? So we actually figured out how to build a claims app on the phone so that we could capture the data when they go see the doctor or the hospital. So we captured the data. It used to be just a physical claim receipt, but we digitized that. We also figured out how to upload from the labs the health screening information um, and to bring health screeners to work. And we also had a questionnaire asking people about their lifestyles. So to get them to, to fill it out, we actually took a picture of their face and said, we will age your face according to how many bad habits you have. Brilliant. So people could get a sense of if I do this, then that. If I yeah. do this, then that. Okay. Gamified it and made it right. engaging. But all I heard in the audience was, um, oh my God, I look like my mother. <laughs> This is Inside Asia, and my guest is Rosalind Chow Koo. Before the break, she was telling me the story of how she purchased an insurance brokerage in Singapore only to realize she'd run out of money. She had to ask her employees to work without pay, and they did. The result was a database and IT platform powered by a series of apps that triangulated the way data was collected while still protecting the identity of respondents. CXA uses analytics to generate an aggregate view of healthcare and medical usage. It takes a concerted effort to generate enough data in order to be statistically valid, but that's what CXA does. 
you were talking about the different ways you gamified and triangulated to collect information on people so that you can start to feed back to the insurers insights about their customers. Yes, yes. Um, during my one year when I had a non-solicit clause, we actually worked in my living room and worked with some of my ex-clients, um, one in tech, one in financial services, and one manufacturer, to actually figure out what they wanted. And it was during that period where we got so much feedback about what they needed and the data they needed. Mm. So our first clients when we went alive were Google, Seagate, and Amex. Why, because because they, they helped us. They got this because they understood the power of data. Yes, okay. yes. And they were the ones who guided us to build this. Oh, interesting. So then, so then, as you built out your, your version one, how how did what were some of the problems you encountered in 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 getting the data right and using the analysis appropriately? Um, so, not everyone goes to health screening, mm. so we had to find ways to get a lot engaged. Um, our first health screening was with American Express, and we got the leadership to be super involved in order to get all the participants involved. Mm -hmm. They also paid their employees. Mm -hmm. So we figured out how to do it. So they paid their employees for doing a health screening and doing a questionnaire um, and doing a, a, a healthy activity. So there's something that you have in, in your approach that Obamacare does not have, mm -hmm. which is basically personal responsibility for your own health, yes, right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the other side of the equation? So you're able to kind of let people customize their health care mm -hmm. policies within a corporation. So there's an yes. element, but the reason there's, there's ways they can use credits uh, in order to improve or better their health. Can you explain yes, that? Yes. So what we actually did was we gave each employee a wallet, but it was funded by the, the money that companies spent on insurance for them. And the thing about Asia is that since every company is giving everyone a family plan, if they're a family, the same family can't go to two insurance companies for the same claim. So you have overlapping benefits. So what we allow people to do was to opt down to the adequate amount of insurance and move the rest into prevention. So people got to choose what was the right amount of insurance and shift some of that treatment spend into prevention spend. So based on the profile, like yes. are my kids young or old? I mean, are they healthy? Are they not healthy? Exactly. Do they have asthma? Are they athletes? Yes. Yeah. Or if you're young and single and healthy, you don't need as much as someone married with a family. Right. So you can move some of the money to, to actually look better, to go to the gym, and do everything else you need. So it's a drawdown. It's a it's a wallet with a, it's it's a what do they call a. Um, uh, it's like a spending account. Yeah, it's, spending. Yes. So, so you just draw down. Yes. So you're yes. given a hundred dollars, and then you use that hundred dollars for health benefits or for exercise or other activities. Yes. Yes. Right. Whatever you need. Okay. So, so explain so. explain some of the and then you have to go out and build alliances and 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 find partners to to support this, right? Yeah. So we. Um, found lots of gyms, um, yoga, pilates, smoking cessation, diabetes management, hypertension, everything, alcohol abuse, but no one's gone to those programs. Um, and so, and mental wellness, pain. So we actually found 800 different partners. You have 800 partners signed yes, up? Yes, on our platform so that they don't have to pay cash, the employees, they just go with our e-vouchers and you know use it so by the end of the the policy year if they don't use up all the money the firm gets it back so we found a way for them to sweep the balance into charities uh, so just just icing on the cake good, here right yeah, yeah, so right. you know you can shift from treatment to prevention and also you know shift extra money to charities mm. So then you had a situation where you're looking at, you know, regional global companies. Um, yeah. Those are some of your anchor tenants. You were in Singapore, but then you had to go and build presence because all these people have employees in other markets across yeah, Asia. Exactly. And every market in Asia has a different set of, uh, you know, kind of labor laws and healthcare yes. requirements. So what did you then do? How did you raise the money to then buy other, other brokerage arrangements in other markets? So I actually decided after buying my first one in Singapore not to buy any more. 
instead to spend the money on the tech and the talent, but just to partner for the other markets. Mm -hmm. So in Hong Kong, you can apply for a license. In China, we're working with Fosun, which is one of the large Chinese conglomerates. And in the other seven countries, all of Southeast Asia, India, Korea, Taiwan, we partner with a UK brokerage firm named Howden. Okay. So now you have coverage, complete yeah. coverage in it. I have licenses in 10 countries yeah. now. So right. we're about to expand in 10 countries. Yeah. So I raised 25 million US yeah. in order to expand and buy staff in other countries and expand our platform and operations so we can support 10 countries. Yeah. And there's the, a little interesting story about that new investor. You want to tell us who that is? Yeah, so Eduardo Sovereign is one of our new investors. He's one of the founders of Facebook. Really, really into healthcare and insurance and e-commerce, which is what we do. And he lives in Singapore, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. He does. He lives right here. So we're really lucky to have someone of his caliber here. Right. So now with this additional investment, what's the plan? How are you kind of, are you going to expand and grow it? Are you clearly 800 partners? I don't know how much further you can go on the partner front. What, what's the objective uh, to taking it in the next two to three years? So a couple of things we're doing. Um, one of the other investors is the Singapore government with Philips. Mm. Um, and our last investor is a reinsurer. So we're actually building a new innovation for the market. Mm. What the reinsurer is doing is guaranteeing a reduction in your premium the next three years if the company can prove that they improve obesity, cholesterol, diabetes. With Philips, what we're doing is we're actually bringing their disease management and their wellness. We're integrating all of their data analytics capabilities because they bought a health population analytics company in Baltimore, brought out to, to Singapore. And so we're integrating their technologies. They actually have all of these medical devices with these health nurse back offices and the data analytics. Yeah, and two years ago, they threw in. They got rid of, they're getting rid of their lighting business and everything exactly. else. They're all healthcare now. Yes, they're yeah. all healthcare, yeah. and we are their first investment, mm -hmm. and we are their channel into the workplace. Okay. So if I can link the disease management programs and the prevention programs with outcomes and get a guarantee reduced premium, yeah. I can link wellness initiatives to health to cost savings. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And, and Philips in, in manufacturing these devices, both, you know, when you're healthy and running or when you're in or post-op, um, yes. you collecting real-time information, exactly. which only layers and creates a deeper dive understanding of the profile of that healthcare, of that patient. Exactly. Yeah. So we're correlating claims data with lifestyle data, yeah. with behavioral data and health screening data. Yeah. So we know which lifestyles are leading to these diseases yeah. and having to go see the doctor. So we're reverse engineering it. Yeah. So you are to the healthcare industry, frankly, what Uber is to the taxi services and what Airbnb is to the hotels, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we are the marketplace yeah. that integrates all the providers for the workplace. Yeah. So the second thing we're doing in the next three years is that we've just signed up five insurers who will white label our platform. Mm -hmm. So insurance companies out in Asia don't have a platform, so we are their platform so that they could cross-sell more insurances to their staff and also capture the data. But how do, don't they then cannibalize their traditional business by doing that? Yes. Mm. How are they yes. going to get through that? Yes. So I think they're starting slowly by starting with the workplace. Mm. Um, because agents don't really sell the workplace, brokers do, but now they can cross sell more insurances. Yeah. What do you mean by the workplace? So just corporations oh, okay. and SMEs. Right. So they're starting there, um, but insurance companies do have to go electronic, yeah. and this is their way of doing it. If they don't have a platform, they can white label mine. Yeah. There's been so much banter among insurance companies about the fact, just like telcos, they have access to customer data in ways mm -hmm. others don't, and so much criticism that they're not doing enough with it. Yes. And yet, it took somebody like you and CXA to step in and really kind of rattle the cages a little bit, get people to realize we really do need to move into data. We do. We mm -hmm. do. Data is the key to understanding your customers, which insurers didn't because they use brokers and agents. Right. 
So this gives them the understanding they need. So they were disintermediated by the brokers. They didn't have access. They didn't own the, exactly. the customer experience. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. So, but old brokers only sold and the insurance companies did the work. Mm -hmm. I want to be different. So our whole proposition is if you appoint me as a broker, you get my platform for free. Why would you go back to an old traditional broker like a travel agent who only negotiated the price? Right. Yeah, exactly. Why don't we go electronic entirely and do this? So why wouldn't you come if it's exactly the same cost? And what you're doing is you're buying your insurance through me, but I convert it to prevention, disease management, and lower costs. Yeah. Well, you heard it here. Rosalind Chow Ku, she's on her way. And uh, this time, it sounds like you've found a career. Yeah, and we our company just got value at $100 million. So now, finally, people are coming to join me. Before we were value at $100 million, all the veterans didn't want to join. Yeah. So it's great. Yeah, amazing success story. Uh, we're going to be watching it in the months and years to come. And thanks so much for taking time out. Thank you. That was my conversation with Rosalind Chow Ku, founder and CEO of CXA the first private insurance and workplace wellness exchange in Asia. For more information, to download our other episodes, and to read more about Rosalind and her extraordinary business model, head to www.insideasiapodcast.com. Until next time, this is Steve Stein saying, coming from the outside on Inside Asia.